The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We'll be in Matthew chapter 1, reading verses 18 through 25. As you're turning there, I do encourage you, I hope you'll make it to our Christmas Eve service. It's always, as Rhonda said, it's one of my favorite services as well every year. And then you may notice there in your bulletin also next Sunday, my friend Will Deal will be with you all uh, preaching. Will, you may remember, used to carry a wooden pin in my shirt pocket. Will's the guy who turns those, so he might take orders after church if you have any interest. But uh, he didn't tell me to say that, so don't, don't, uh, don't repeat that, I guess. But Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, we'll read through verse 25. <clears throat> now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And he named him Jesus. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray, we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? And perhaps his most famous play, that's what William Shakespeare puts on the lips of a young Juliet as she expresses her love to Romeo. If you know that tragedy, if you know that story of that young couple, then you know that it is in fact their names that initially keep them from being together. Juliet's family, the Capulets, Romeo's family, the Montagues, were the Shakespearean equivalent of the Hatfields and McCoys. That's to say they didn't really get along with one another. But Juliet, however, doesn't care, and her love for the boy from the Montague family provokes the question that summarizes what I think, and maybe some others, is the entire conflict of the play. What's in a name? Well, what is in a name? What does a name really matter? I, I suppose you can make the case that names really aren't all that important these days. I mean, do you get nervous when someone asks you your name? I don't. I don't get nervous about typing my name into forms online, at least not anymore. I don't get nervous to give anyone my name over the phone. It's only really when I start adding other information that I might get a little nervous, but even then, who cares? If they want it, they can have it, I'm sure. What's your date of birth, sir? Address? Social Security number? Credit card number? Uh, what's your blood type? Maybe even worse, what's your Amazon password? I don't... don't then again, I've got a pretty common name. Chris Thomas is, is pretty common. I've Googled myself before, and never have I seen my name pop up. You've got to go one or two or three pages over, unless Google's got you figured out and who you are and where you are, to find out who I am. Most of the time, it's just some random uh, third-string NFL receiver. I don't get his paycheck, sadly. Uh, or sometimes it's Chris Thomas King. Any of you know who that is? Blues musician. He was on Oh Brother Where Art Thou a few years ago. I don't think names have as much meaning these days. Take, for example, a man named Doug Smith, Doug Alice, Alan Smith Jr., to be precise. Uh, he lives in Eugene, Oregon. 
And a few years ago, he was a fan of the show called Chuck. Any of you ever see that show? I never saw it. After seeing it, though, apparently at some point in that show, someone has a certain name, and he liked it so much, he changed his name to it. If you were to ask him for his identification on it, it would no longer say Douglas Allen Smith Jr. or Doug or Mr. Smith. No, today his name is legally Captain Awesome. <laughs> He's a grown man. So yeah, I guess you can make the case that names aren't all that important. But then again, then again, if you're having a baby, names can be important, aren't they? Sally and I had a couple, they were having twins, and they decided to decide on the names in sort of a, a college basketball bracket. They put the names they liked, and then people voted. I think they had picked out all along, but they would update us all along on blogs and social media. According to Amazon, if you were to Google baby book names, there are at least 2,000 books for baby names alone. People fret over whether or not they're going to give their child a good name. So I guess you could make the case that names are actually important. When we were first getting Cole, we received his file. It had his Chinese name, Long Sin Hua, which doesn't really roll off the South Alabama tongue. But he also had his English name, Cole, K-O-H-L, like the store. And Sally and I liked it. It seemed to fit him. And so while we were in China, we were pushing coal around in the stroller, and other people say, oh, this is our son, Joseph. We named him after our great-great-grandfather. Or this is Hezekiah. He's named after one of the great kings of, of whatever, whatever. Uh, Why did y'all name Kyle? Oh, we just liked it. And it came that way. Um, <laughs> we chose Carter's name. We didn't like his English name so much. I liked it. His nickname was Han Han. Think about it, y'all. Han Han Solo Thomas. <laughs> but Sally, as she always is, is wiser and vetoed it, and so we named him after one of my Baptist heroes, Jimmy Carter. Regardless of whether you think names are important or not today, there is no doubt that names in the ancient world were incredibly important. Your name gave you an identity. It didn't just appear on a roll so people knew who you were. It told strangers exactly who you were, what you did, and where you were from. Knowing someone's name meant that you knew that person, even without having met that person. Furthermore, in the ancient world, particularly of the Hebrew Bible, to know a God's name meant you could control and even manipulate that God, which is why in Exodus 3, when Moses says to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent to me, sent me to you, and they ask, what's his name? What am I supposed to say? God doesn't say Greg. God doesn't even actually say Yahweh or Jehovah. God says in Hebrew, Yahweh, but all that is is I am. Just I am. Tell them I am, and that's enough. And names in the ancient world were extremely important, which, of course, I think shines a whole other light on this familiar passage that we always read around this time of year, particularly, particularly when we see how it impacts Joseph and his relationship to the child. In verses 20 and 21, we, we read where it says, But just when Joseph had resolved to divorce Mary quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, his own name, saying who he was. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, up until this point, things weren't all that great for Joseph. I mean, think about it for a moment. His betrothed was pregnant with what was obviously someone else's baby. He faced disgrace or the difficult decision of divorce from a woman he never really got a chance to call his wife. And while you and I may think an angelic dream is something to be welcomed, Joseph would have initially thought it was something to be feared. You don't get visited by angels with good news in the Bible. Not usually. 
But here, here, Joseph is visited. The angel that appears in Joseph's dream doesn't give him some sort of divine divorce counseling. He doesn't give him advice regarding on who to call to handle the ordeal quietly. No, instead, the angel just heaps more onto Joseph. And it has everything to do with that name. You see, in the family customs of ancient Judaism, the father names the child. So if we had been Jewish, Carter would be Han Han. I'm just saying. It was understood that he was claiming the child as his. That's why the father did it. When he saw the child, he named it to say, this is mine. It was an understood thing. And so in verse 25, when Matthew tells us, and Joseph named him Jesus, and he named him Jesus, Joseph put aside all those former notions of divorce, took Mary as his wife, and Jesus as his son. No wonder, Matthew says, he was a righteous man. But back to this whole name business. I mean, why Jesus? The angel tells Joseph in verse 21, you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. Now, now we are so used to the name Jesus, we, we sort of think it's, it's singularly for him. I mean, I don't know how many of y'all go to Baja. There's someone there who's a manager named Jesus. It's always a little, t- it's always a little joke. Who's in charge? Jesus. That's what it says when you walk out. We're just so used to it. But the name Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Yahweshua. Or to shorten it up, Yeshua, or to transliterate it, Joshua, which literally means Yahweh saves. God, the Lord saves. So that seems pretty straightforward. We say Jesus, but in their mind they're saying, oh, this is our little boy, the Lord saves. Because God is going to save his people through him. Never mind the overwhelming responsibility that must have thrown upon Joseph. What about that passage from Isaiah that Matthew quotes in verse 23? Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Can you think of any passage in the Gospels where the disciples and Jesus are walking around and Peter says something like, hey, hey, Emmanuel, where are we going for lunch? No. They don't really call him that. That's not really his name. Matthew is referring to this prophecy from Isaiah about a child in the midst of exile who will be born as a sign, a sign of hope, a sign of peace, a sign of restoration to the people of Israel, that liberation is on its way, that exile is over. Before Isaiah says, before this child knows right from wrong, while he's still stumbling around on the ground, you will be freed. Matthew's referring to that part of the prophecy, an end of tyranny, the beginning of a new era in the history of Israel, one marked by prosperity and joy. So maybe you can see why Matthew found that passage, that prophecy fitting and referring to Jesus, not necessarily Mary, but to Jesus as Emmanuel. Of course, Jesus is known by many names. Jesus, Christ, Messiah, the Word, the Son of God, the Son of David. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And John, he calls himself the Good Shepherd. John the Baptist calls him the Lamb of God. Revelation, we hear him called the Alpha and Omega. John again, the Vine, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And during this season of Advent and Christmas, one of the names of Christ that truly stands out, the Prince of Peace. That title comes from another passage from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9, verse 6. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What's in that name? If Jesus is the Prince of Peace, Why do we still seem to be running on a little more than just fumes of peace? 
I mean, when Mary cradled the Christ child in her arms, Joseph called him Jesus, the Lord saves. Did they think that some two millennia later, that some of the ground they walked on would be torn apart by bullets and bombs? When Matthew undoubtedly read the prophecies of Isaiah, could he have ever imagined the future followers of Christ lining up to go to fight in war after war? Did those shepherds, those magi, those first followers of Jesus ever consider that those of us who follow him today would still deal with the chaotic cacophony of doubt, depression, fear, anxiety? After all, is this what it means for God to save us? That we should be tossed about by the violence of sin and evil in this world? Waiting either for death or some apocalyptic second coming to take place and take us away to where peace is just peace. Not only from war, but pain, heartache, tragedy, and death. Is this really who the Prince of Peace is? Is this really who Yahweh saves is? It may seem that way to you at times. It may seem that way to me at times. That Christ only shows up in the cradle at Christmas on the cross on Good Friday, strutting out of the tomb on Easter morning. It may seem to you that the salvation that Jesus offers is a part of some eternal sort of layaway program. You pay a little bit now, but you get the reward at the end, right? It may seem that the Prince of Peace is simply holding it all back. Wait, let's wait a little bit longer, waiting for the hereafter distributed among the clouded mansions of heaven. It may seem that way to us. But then we hear again this other name of Jesus. The name I think that matters most. They shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. What's in that name? God is with us. God is with us when the holidays seem too depressing to bear. Emmanuel, God is with us when the way is dark and cold. Emmanuel, God is with us when it feels like, when it feels like there will never, ever be peace. Emmanuel, when the pain of death, the sting of doubt, the weight of addiction, depression, anxiety, and fear, when the loneliness of life is all too much and you feel like you'll never find hope, joy, peace, love, Emmanuel, God is with us. Friends, I'm convinced that's what this is all about. Advent, Christmas, the very message and person of Christ himself. God is with us. Not far away on some distant throne in heaven, not tucked behind a curtain in a temple, not locked between the leather-bound pages of a book. God is with us. We are not alone. We are never alone in this world. We are not alone in our darkness. We are not alone in our joy. We are not alone when we've lost everything. We're not alone when we feel like we've got it all. We are not alone. Emmanuel, God is with us. And that's the truth. No matter what else you cling to, no matter what else all sort of falls in the way, the only truth that really matters is God is with us. Emmanuel. That's the truth of Christmas. That's the truth of Christ himself. God is with us. God is with you even now. How will you respond to God's presence with us?
now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Emmanuel. Lord, we don't know how. And I'll be honest, I don't know why. But God, you're with us. Help us to trust that. Help us to believe that. But Lord, most of all, help us to live that. Not only in this season of Advent and Christmas, but each day of our lives. Be with us now, Lord, as you always are and always will be. But help us, God. Help us to take hold of your presence and to answer your call now. We pray in the name of Emmanuel, Christ our Lord, God with us. Amen.